for all those who voted for Trump as a protest to Gaza or third party, especially in the swing states, could it be argued that this is going to be or always was going to be a spectacular own goal? And I don't think we can equivocate completely between people who voted for Trump out of pain and grief and sadness and people who decided to strategically vote third party. I don't agree with people who voted for Trump. Even though I understood where they were coming from, I told them I don't agree with it. I think it's a mistake. Anyone continuously talking about, no, that we can still do something is being disingenuous. I refer to them as thieves and scoundrels. I should have probably added liars in that statement because that's what it was. In that situation, you could call it uh, pragmatism. You could call it, you know, uh, strategic uh, thinking. But in that context, is it really that unreasonable for someone to condemn what ha Hamas did on October the 7th? When we talk about what's happening now, I refuse to sit here and engage with people who by their very nature don't value facts. I am not seeking space on those mainstream outlets. I'm seeking a space to say the truth. Hello and welcome to the Muslim Viewpoint, a new video podcast series powered by the nonprofit national media platform American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Rafat Malik. Today we are joined by Hudayfa Ahmed, who is the spokesperson for the influential Abandon Harris movement, which played a critical role in rallying American Muslims and Arabs to vote third party and pressurize the current Biden administration to enforce a ceasefire in Gaza and enforce an arms embargo against Israel. Israel. I spoke to him earlier. Hudayfa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So the outcome of the 2024 election is clear. The Democrats have had a comprehensive drubbing, losing the presidency, the popular vote by over 5 million, the Senate and now the House. Are you able to quantify what role the genocide in Gaza played in this election result? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when the results were first announced Tuesday night, um, a lot of people saw it as an absolute drubbing. It wasn't even close. It was a massive loss. However, as the votes were being counted, you saw that the numbers were actually a lot closer than what was led on. For example, Wisconsin, there were four swing states that swung uh, by a vote margin that was lower than the Muslim population, Muslim American population that existed within those swing states. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. If you look at the numbers uh, in terms of how many votes Donald Trump won that election by versus how many Muslim Americans live in those uh, swing states, you'll see that the genocide in the Gaza played a crucial part. And this is just us saying Muslim Americans, not even Arab Americans, or even allies who were horrified by, by, by what the Democratic Party was doing. Okay. Well, that is, it's interesting that you say that because if you look at all the election postmortems that are going on and all the national media, uh, aside from the occasional reference to abandoned Harris movement and um, uncommitted and the mention of disaffection amongst Arabs and Muslims, it's like the crisis in Gaza had little or no impact on that outcome. Is that what you've also seen in, in terms of the approach by the political elite and the mainstream media? Pretty much, yes. Uh, I would go as far as to say that the only two media outlets who have accurately, to some degree, covered exactly what happened the last six weeks before the election were the New York Times and, ironically, Fox News. What ended up happening was that we had two goals. The initial one of abandon Biden that transformed to abandon Harris. Get a community that voted for the Democratic Party unequivocally for 22 years to abandon that party. That was our initial goal. Afterwards, our goal was let's get them to vote third party. Let's get them to consolidate their vote behind a candidate that could quantify what the anti-genocide vote was. To be fair, that was beyond what our first initial goal was. And so we endorsed Jill Stein on October 7th and told people who didn't agree with our endorsement, vote for any third party. It doesn't matter whether you agree with us or not. What ended up happening, and the New York Times and Fox News were the only ones who covered this accurately, is that Trump and Vance saw an opportunity. And so for the last four to six weeks of the election, they spent time campaigning on an anti-war message, promising that we will bring back peace, that we will end the war, which we didn't expect 
them to campaign on at all. I didn't, for one, expect them to actually be saying this stuff out loud. I could understand private promises. And if there was private promises, I could work within that skepticism to convince a lot of the people who ended up voting for Trump not to vote for him. But he was just saying this stuff publicly, which pretty much uh, kneecapped our efforts towards achieving our second goal. So what we ended up with was a significant portion of people who were afraid Kamala would win due to the narrative that was being put out there, switch their part and switch their vote from third party to Republican Party, or some people just flat out said, I will not vote. So um, can you tell me just a little bit more about your involvement in the abandoned uh, Biden movement and also the rationale or justification for transferring it to the abandoned Harris movement when some people argued that Harris was actually drawing a line between her approach to the issue of Gaza and Biden's approach, uh, which was overtly, obviously, um, Zionist, and also, you know, he was refusing to uh, do anything that jeopardized uh, Israel's stance, and that she was, in fact, more sympathetic to the Palestinians. Uh, had you worked with her, she, you could have had perhaps more influence on her policy were she re-elected. I mean, look, it wasn't very hard as time went on to convince people to jump on the abandoned Biden bandwagon. The images and videos we were seeing out of us that were absolutely atrocious. Combine that with the fact that Joe Biden was publicly coming out and saying he was supportive of what was happening. As a matter of fact, he decided to run point on being a mouthpiece for the state of Israel. Evidence of 40 beheaded babies in the White House had to quietly retract that statement. He got up and, and said, I don't trust that the Palestinians are being honest about their casualties. Trying to run interference on the fact that Israel was killing Palestinians at such an alarming rate he got up and lied at the White House podium to try to delay the inevitable outrage. Then came the resignation and then came uh, not the, res- the, the announcement that he would not seek re-election. And then came the endorsement of Harris. And we gave Harris four weeks. Distance yourself from Biden's monstrous foreign policy. Give us something. From July 21st to August 18th, nothing. As a matter of fact, a couple of reporters took our press release to the Harris campaign and asked for commentary. And they said, we got no answer in return. There was no comments. So we made the decision to relaunch as abandoned Harris on August 19th. And we were immediately vindicated by the fact that the Democratic Party treated the uncommitted movement the way they did. If you can't even give Palestinians a speaking slot at your convention for a speech that you have already vetted and approved and signed off on, you weren't going to do anything after you got the votes. We don't believe in this narrative of just vote for the lesser evil now, then hold them accountable afterwards. The entirety of Kamala Harris's campaign showed that she was not willing to budge in any way, shape or form before she even got her votes. There was no way she was going to budge a single inch after she got those votes. And so what our message to the community was, look, we don't have any leverage now. We won't unless we show that we're willing to walk away. And particularly if the other person is Donald Trump, that'll send a very clear message, maybe not to the Democratic Party, but to the voters who will say, look, they're enforcing their red line. They're drawing their red line. We're going to lose this election if they continue with this approach of you're not going to shake us. You're not going to scare us. You're not going to intimidate us. And so there was nothing really to show that Kamala Harris was going to diverge from Biden's foreign policy. A foreign policy, by the way, which John Kirby outlined, she wasn't just standing by as Biden was making all the decisions. John Kirby said she has been a major player with regard to this administration's foreign policy, specifically with regard to Gaza. And then her getting up on the interview and saying, I can't think of a single thing I I would do different than Joe Biden, except I would probably appoint more Republicans to my cabinet. That's not someone who was going to diverge from the uh, path that Joe Biden laid out in any way, shape or form. I want to just go to your statement, the Abandoned Harris Movement, published on November the 6th, where you called those within the Muslim American community who encouraged support for Kamala Harris as thieves and scoundrels. I just want to ask you, why is it unreasonable for Muslim Democrats who do care about Gaza to want to fight and lobby within the party? And why should they discard decades of investing in the party with tangible gains, such as, you know, the dozens of Muslims who have been appointed within the administration? administration when they argue they could build on that in a future administration? That's an excellent question. Um, I think we need to outline what exactly the goals of that involvement within the Democratic Party were and what results they yielded. Were those people actually representing the grievances and the interests 
uh, and the concerns of their community? Or was their goal solely to just rally the Muslim American vote towards the Democratic Party? We are actually representatives of the Democratic Party to the Muslim community, not the other way around. And it became clear as time went on, as the genocide got worse, as Kamala Harris unequivocally stated time and time and time again, I will ensure Israel gets what it wants and what it needs. It became clear that those individuals who had positioned themselves and labeled themselves and presented themselves as representatives of the Muslim American community to the Democratic Party were in fact representatives of the Democratic Party to the Muslim American community. We're talking 22 years of involvement in work. And those 22 years, all two decades, could not stop a single U.S.-made bullet from making it into an Israeli gun and through the skull of a Palestinian child in Gaza. So anyone continuously talking about how, no, that we can still do something is being disingenuous. I refer to them as thieves and scoundrels. I should have probably added liars in that, in that, in that statement because that's what it was. And the, the environment we find ourselves in now with regards to the Muslim American political strategy is that organizations like Engage, MPAC, Uncommitted, have witnessed the mass exodus of Muslim American involvement. No one really sees them as credible anymore. No one sees them as reliable anymore. No one sees them as honest and truthful anymore. What they see them as, as people who sold them a false dream, a false promise, and now they want no part of that. And so that's part of, I guess, what the work that needs to be done afterwards in terms of forming a coalition and a campaign and a movement that will function as the representatives of the Muslim American community, its political interests, its concerns, its grievances to the United States government, not the other way around. Uh, you mentioned the uncommitted movement. Um, and uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that was formed back in March 2024 by mainly, I think, Democratic Muslim leaders and activists who were pushing for voting uncommitted in the primary election over Biden's refusal to back a Gaza ceasefire. Was there ever any formal link between Abandon, Harris and uncommitted movement at any point? We worked together during the Democratic primary to bring out the Muslim vote for a primary. Keep in mind, we all united because it was very difficult to get people to come out and vote in a primary, which they knew Joe Biden would win anyway. But the idea wasn't to win. The idea was to send a message, to send a statement. That's what we did. Our paths diverged. We went our separate ways because they saw that they wanted to try and leverage the Democratic Party from within. They wanted to appeal to the conscious of the Democratic Party. We made it clear that we didn't believe the Democratic Party had a conscious and that you weren't going to be able to change anything from within. The only leverage we had was proving we could walk away. I mean, the uncommitted movement has now uh, split. I think you'll, you'll be aware of that. And it was part in part due to reports that it had received re uh, seed money and funding from a pro-democratic PAC to the tune of $400,000, which barred them from supporting third party presidential candidates. Were you aware of this at the time when you were working with them? Did this come as a surprise to you? It came as a massive shock. I found out when everyone else found out which is when the article was released and reading through it, I expected it. I was like, okay, they got thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Maybe they used it for expenses. But when I saw it was $430,000, and then I look up the organization and in it, it says that they are staunchly against third party endorsements. Uncommitted statement made a lot more sense in, in hindsight, in the sense of their, they had very strong language against voting for Trump. They had very strong language against voting third party. They had very strong language against setting up this election. But when it came down to Kamala Harris, they said, we just can't endorse her. Um, so basically, I, it was what I referred to as a roundabout endorsement. Obviously, you mentioned uh, third parties and the fact that the abandoned Harris movement supported Jill Stein and Butch Ware, uh, the Green Party presidential nominees. Were you concerned that people like Palestinian academic and attorney Noura Erekat had refused to join the ticket, the Green Party? ticket because, in essence, she argued that the Gaza was not a priority for the Green Party and they had other party political considerations. Did you understand that point of view or uh, that criticism of the Green Party? No, yeah, I understood it. Noura Erekat was working within the scope of, from my opinion, from what I saw, the scope of trying to end the genocide as soon as possible. So if her involvement with the Green Party could be leveraged to say, look, 
We'll stop the campaign, stop, make a ceasefire, unequivocal, permanent ceasefire, and we'll stop the Green Party campaign. It made sense from her, from her vantage point. However, the Green Party has goals beyond just that. And it's also building a party that can actually represent the leftist side of the country, seeing as the Democratic and Republicans are moving further right with every passing year. And so I actually understood both sides. And I we leaned with the fact that there's a long term strategy that needs to be employed with regard to electoral politics. Even though we see it as just one avenue and one strategy, we'd like to end the genocide ASAP, which is why we were willing to dissolve our movement if Kamala Harris had actually done what was asked of her, if Joe Biden had done what was asked of him. But at the same time, we are also aware of the fact that there has to be a long-term strategy towards building an apparatus to ensure that something like this never happens again. I want to ask you, is someone guilty of both sides as a pro-Palestinian supporter, perhaps speaking in the mainstream media or arena, if they publicly state what Hamas did on October the 7th was abhorrent and a war crime, and by the same token, what Israel has done every day since October the 7th is also abhorrent and war crimes. I think you engage in both sides of them when you start the story on October 7th. And I say this to whoever will hear it. From January 1st, 2023, until October 6th, 2023, Israel had killed more Palestinians than at any other time since 2006. This is barring mass scale mowing the lawn campaigns of 2009 and 2014. We're talking a period where there was no conflict, there was no aggression, you know, between Gaza and Israel in terms of what happened in 2014, 2009. January 1, 2023, October 6, 2023, more Palestinians had been killed in this so-called quote-unquote period of peace than at any time since 2006. And that's not talked about. Anyone who starts a story in the middle is not engaging in both sides of them. They're engaging in, in an absolute betrayal of the truth. They're engaging in absolute betrayal of anything moral or ethical. Oppressors like to start the story in the middle. We'd like to start the story from the very beginning in order to get the full context. But Deva, when you're talking about a political system and a media that is dominated by Zionist voices and very strong pro-Israel voices going back decades, isn't it almost impossible to, well, first of all, to even have a platform if you don't do the basic of denouncing terrorism, whether it's Hamas or whether it's Israel, whether that's the beginning or the middle of the story, I think some would argue isn't the point. The point is that you cannot be in those mainstream spaces unless you do that basic uh, denouncement and using that as a tool to focus on what's really going on, which is the long-term occupation and brutalization and oppression of the Palestinian people. In that situation, you could call it uh, pragmatism, you could call it you know, uh, strategic uh, thinking. But in that context, is it really that unreasonable for someone to condemn what ha Hamas did on October the 7th? Look, it starts off with the I'm implying that those mainstream outlets are objective in any way, shape, or form. We saw Abby Phillips of CNN talking about the 40 beheaded babies, and then when it turned out it was false, she deleted it without any public acknowledgement or apology. The same Abby Phillips who acted horrified at how Mehdi Hassan was spoken to on her panel. Look, that's already been tried before by multiple people. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. And if it would have been something that worked, we would have seen it work with Mehdi Hassan instead. All we get from Mehdi Hassan is him sitting on a CNN panel. And someone tells him, I hope your paper doesn't go off. It doesn't matter how many, how many times you condemn. It doesn't matter. Condemnation is a waste of time. Equivocation is a, is, is a waste of time. What we want to do is we want to address the story exactly as it plays out, exactly as it is. You know what? Have atrocities been committed? Yeah. But we're not going to start there. We're going to start at the very genesis of everything that's taken place. And it starts with, as Malcolm X said, European power using Israel as a satellite, as a proxy, as a colonial state against the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa. When we talk about what's taking place now, when we talk about what's happening now, I refuse to sit here and engage with people who, by their very nature, are dishonest, by their very nature, don't value facts. We saw how Jake Tapper spoke during the early weeks after October 7th. We saw how he played a role in propagating the lie that there was a military compound underneath a Shifat hospital. And yet no one seems to be holding him accountable for the lies. 
the equivocation, the blatant propaganda being a mouthpiece of an apartheid regime. So when you talk about if we want space on those mainstream outlets, I'm not seeking space on those mainstream outlets. I'm seeking a space to say the truth exactly as it is. I don't want someone to tell me how to say the truth. We are going to say it exactly how it is. And we're not going to sit here and pretend like a lot of these mainstream outlets are objective. They're not. Yeah, we could definitely testify to, you know, we've been covering the coverage by the mainstream media and the level of bias and the omission of, you know, what's going on, or failing to even report what's going on in Gaza has been absolutely shocking. I just want to end with looking at where we are now, just a, a couple of weeks after the election or a week or so after the election. We have a Trump presidency looming and already he is announcing cabinet administration picks, which as expected are heavily Zionist, pro-Israel, like Mike Huckabee as Israel ambassador, uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik as UN ambassador, both very pro-Israel. For all those who voted for Trump as a protest to Gaza or third party, especially in the swing states, could it be argued that this is going to be or always was going to be a spectacular own goal? And I don't think we can equivocate completely between people who voted for Trump out of pain, grief and sadness and people who decided to strategically vote third party. I don't agree with people who voted for Trump. Even though I understood where they were coming from, I told them I don't agree with it. I think it's a mistake. But at the same time, I recognize that when someone engages in an act of self-harm, there's a lot deeper issues that go beyond what I see on the surface. That's number one. Number two, I think the Donald Trump presidency will do what it did in his first term, which is lay bare the reality of the United States not being an objective mediator in any way, shape or form. So, for example, when people bring up clips of Mike Huckabee saying, you know, this has always been Judea and Samara, so on and so forth. The question I ask is, how is that different than what Bill Clinton said when he was sent to Michigan on behalf of Kamala Harris? Those are exactly the same words from two different parties. Bill Clinton, up until he said what he said in Michigan, was always seen as some sort of objective mediator when it came to Oslo, when it came to the Camp David Accords. It just simply wasn't true. What we're going to see is we're going to see a lot more concern with regard to the Palestinian cause because the face of the U.S. imperialism is now Donald Trump, is now a Republican. No one really talks about how Antony Blinken gave the Israeli military permission to strike humanitarian aid convoys. But all of a sudden, we're going to pass clips of what Rubio said to, to um, protesters at Capitol Hill. I think we need to witness like what's exactly happening. We're seeing people having outrage at a future secretary of state for what he said, which is great, and ignoring what the current secretary of state has said and done, particularly with regard to the fact that he gave Israel a 30-day ultimatum to get aid into Gaza. And when that ultimatum was missed, the secretary of state, Anthony Blinken, just threw up his hand and said, whatever. That's basically what happened. We're going to see a lot more outrage with regard to what happened in Palestine. I would not refer to it as an own goal. I would refer to it as a revelation. I'd refer to it as a unveiling of the mass for the second time, because everything that's happened under the Biden administration will continue to happen under the Trump administration. The only difference will be the Palestinians will most likely garner more support because the person carrying out those atrocities is now a Republican that they hate. What's next for the abandoned Harris movement? What's your name going to be next, first of all? And also, are you how are you going to continue lobbying and working in this sphere? Look, we obviously gained a lot of momentum in the past year. People were appreciative of Ben and Harris's leadership's ethical stance, unequivocal stance, the firm stance with regard to what was happening. I would say waiver like other organizations did. And so what's next remains to be seen. Currently, we're still focused on trying to pressure Democrats to do something in the last two months of Biden's reign. And we're going to discuss what we're going to do during Trump's reign. We're most likely going to fight Trump's reign, but in regard to our name, our strategy, our path moving forward, some people have suggested that, you know, J.D. Vance will most likely have presidential aspirations in four years. And he has seen what we've done to a sitting vice president who decided to run for president. And maybe we'll pressure that point. I don't know. As of now, I just told because we're made up of volunteers. I told the volunteers, take a break. Take a moment to rebuild your lives, gather yourselves, and we'll continue this in a couple of weeks, if not by the end of the year. But as of now, we're still in discussions about how to move forward, not whether we're going to move forward. We're definitely going to move forward, but just how. Hudayfa Ahmed, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you for having me.